Well, glory to God. God is good. He's good all the time. Hallelujah. We welcome you this morning, those of you that are watching online as well, to our uh, Graceful Fellowship. We have our series, Go series, that we started last week, and we gave you a little bit of a challenge, and that is to find and ask God to give you at least four people, four families that you can identify who don't know Christ, and you would like to see them come to Christ. How many of you are, already know some people like that? All right, many of you don't. If you don't, you need to ask the Lord because part of your task in the kingdom of God is to see that people come to the Lord. Today we're going to talk about our second part of our challenge in the Go series is to intercede. It must say intercede. If you turn with me to the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, and also the book of 1 Timothy, Romans chapter 10, 1 Timothy chapter 2. In Romans chapter 10, Paul writes to the Roman church and he says to them, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God, who was he praying to? He was praying to the God of heaven, and he says, for Israel. Who was he praying for? He was praying for Israel, for his countrymen, for his people, right, that he had a burden for. You might have a burden for your friends. You might have a burden for your people that work with you. You might have a burden for people who don't know the Lord, maybe uh, who are your neighbors. And Paul had a burden for Israel. He says, I pray to God, in other words, he interceded for them, that they may be saved. You know what? You could even use that as you pray to God, Lord, my heart's desire is for Paul or Mary or, you know, Juanita or whatever name is, my heart's desire for them is that they may be saved. And so Paul interceded for Israel. And then in 1 Timothy, he wrote to his son who was in the faith, Timothy, and he tells him in chapter, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning of verse 1, he says, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, and there's not men as in masculine, but men as in mankind, all right, that we ought to pray, intercede, and uh, make supplication for all people. And then, he, so in verse 3, he says, because this is good, everybody say good, this is good and acceptable, all right, this is pleasing in the sight of God, he said, our Savior, what? that we intercede and pray for people. And he says, and he says, this God is the one who desires all people, all mankind to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, that there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That's the truth he wants all men to come to the knowledge of. There's only one God and one mediator between that God and lost men, and that is Jesus Christ who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And that's the gospel, Christ gave himself, right, for sinful people so that they could be saved. For which, he says, I have appointed a preacher and an apostle. In other words, God has given us the uh, responsibility to go and to share this good news. But notice that it begins with prayer. If I say prayer. Begins with intercession for all people. Intercession is important if you want to see people come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. What is intercession? We talk about intercession. Well, intercession is to stand in on the behalf of someone before God asking for them or for their need. As a matter of fact, intercession is commanded in the Scripture of us for people, as we read just here, that we are to pray for those who are needing to be saved. Now, why is prayer, why is intercession so important for the lost? And I want to make a statement here, and I want to come to it near the end of the message, and I want to explain to you through the message what I mean by that. So you might not, it might not sound correct to you as you hear it, but I want you to follow along with me. And here's the statement. Intercession has less to do with lost people themselves than it does with God. Intercession, prayer for lost people, has less to do with them, the lost, than it does with God Himself. Now, before I speak to you today about the need for your intercession for the lost, I want to speak to you about you. I want to speak to you about you and about me. And how many of you here know for a certain, without a shadow of a doubt, that you are a Christian, that you're saved, that Christ is, lives in your life? Let me see your hands. 
All right, many of you, you might be watching online as well, and you might be sitting at home, and you're a Christian as well. Now, I want to talk to you about you, as I said, before I talk about intercession, because to intercede for the lost takes this understanding and knowledge that I am about to share with you. So I want to ask you this question. Why, if you are a disciple of Christ, many of you raise your hands today, do you think that you have come to salvation in Christ? Why do you think you've come to salvation in Christ and your neighbor hasn't? Or your friends haven't? Or maybe you have people that you know that died in unbelief. They didn't come to the knowledge of the truth. Why do you believe that Jesus is Lord while many others still have not acknowledged Him or will not perhaps ever acknowledge Him as Lord? What does that mean? So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16 with me. Matthew chapter 16. Now, Paul said something interesting, and I'm just going to quote his words. I'm not going to give you the scripture. You can look it up yourself. But Paul said, who makes you to be different from anyone else? What may, what, who made you different than anyone else? And whatever you have, he says, you've received. So if you've received what you have, what makes you different? Because oftentimes we think, well, I'm a Christian because, you know, I'm not crazy. I'm not dumb. I, I can reason well, and so I'm, you know, pretty sharp. And so when I began to, to think about the claims of Christ, well, I began to place my faith and confidence in Christ. Or, you know, I was raised in Christian parents, a Christian home, and so I had a great heritage, and, and that's why, you know, I became a Christian. And other people might not have that, and so that's why they're not Christians. Why do you believe that Jesus is Lord while many others do not? Matthew chapter 16, I want to go through some of these uh, uh, truths here real quickly so that we can lay a foundation for what I want to share with you. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 13, Jesus said this, uh, or, or the scripture says this, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So he's asking a question. Who do people say that I am? So they said to him, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah, he said, or one of the prophets. And so Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Then I want you to think about that. Well, this is what other people say, but no, no, but, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, of course, he was always very boisterous. He'd always jump into everything. He jumps in and he says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. That's what Christ means, the anointed one of God. You are the anointed Messiah of God, he said to, to, to Jesus. He said, you are the son of the living God. Well, he got that right, didn't he? But Jesus turns to him and he says, hey, you get an A for that. That's a hundred, man, right there. No, he turns to him and he says something very interesting. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon. Now, there might be other people that aren't blessed, but you're blessed. Think about that. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood, and that's a term uh, that means actually people, right? Normal human beings refer to flesh and blood. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, if Simon is blessed because he knows this, because he enunciated this about Jesus, he's the Son, the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus turns around and says to him, well, Simon, you know that because, you know, you're pretty sharp. Because you, you're just a smart guy. I mean, you figured it out. Probably everybody else hasn't figured it out, but you figured it out. No, he said, you are blessed because something has happened to you. Something has been given to you that you don't have or didn't have that now you have, and now you're able to say that. And what is that? Revelation. You have received something from God himself that other people have got yet, or maybe it never will, but you got it. Everybody say blessed. See, if you're a Christian, that's why you're blessed. Because you've received something that is revealed to you. That's why I asked you at the beginning. Why do you believe that Jesus is Lord? 
Is it because you're sharper than anybody else, more intelligent than anybody, more educated than somebody, so you kind of figured out, no. Simon said, uh, uh, Jesus said to Simon, you're blessed, Simon, you don't understand. You're blessed because what you just said, you couldn't know, you couldn't really discern unless my Father had revealed it to you. So we see that God has disclosed and revealed to people what people can't really grasp on their own. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, Jesus, uh, uh, Paul said this, Therefore I make known to you that no one, speaking by the Spirit of God, listen, calls Jesus accursed. All right, nobody can curse Jesus and claim that that's the Spirit of God's inspired him to do that. The Spirit doesn't do that, Paul said. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord. No one can say. Actually, the Greek's more emphatic. It says no one can affirm or call Jesus Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Because you say, well, I can say Jesus is Lord. I don't even know Christ. I can say Jesus is Lord. Yeah, anybody can say it, but to affirm it, to affirm, I know Jesus is Lord. So when Peter said, you're the Christ, you're the Son of the living God, Jesus turned and said, the reason you can say that you know that about me is because my Father revealed it to you. And so what he's saying here is nobody can affirm the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life unless the Holy Spirit has given them that ability to do. So just saying with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, is not what he's talking about. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, what? Lord, Lord, did we do this and this and this in your name? Listen, Jesus said, who are you? I don't know you. So just saying it without, listen, the aid of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, it is He who gives you the certainty that Jesus is Lord. And no one can affirm that without the aid of the Holy Spirit. Turn to John chapter 6, verse 63, beginning of verse 63. Jesus is talking to the people there. He's preached, you know, kind of to them, shared with them many things. And here in chapter 6, fabulous chapter, a lot of revelation here that Jesus makes known. But here in verse 63, he says, it is the Spirit, John 6, 63. Let me turn there real quick. He said, it is the Spirit who gives what? The Spirit gives life. The flesh, he said, profits nothing. And the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, there are some of you here, he says, who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Here we find something else, another important revelation, that you don't even come to Jesus because you want to. Because as we're going to see as we go through the Scripture, that the want to is not there. If you came to Jesus, it was because of an activity of the Father. Because notice, it's very emphatic, No one, no one can. What does the word can describe? Ability. No one has the ability or can come to me just because they want to. We're going to find out a little bit why. Unless, there's a condition, it has been granted to him. By my Father. So again, I ask you, why are you saved today? Why do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Because of the aid of the Holy Spirit. Notice he says, it is the Spirit who gives life. No one can come to me unless the Father, my Father, uh, grants it to him. And then he says, uh, many of the disciples went back, walked, didn't walk with him anymore. Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away too? Simon Peter, again, he jumps in and answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? This is what he says. You have the words of eternal life. How would Peter know that? 
You have the words of eternal life. And listen, and also we have come to what? It's okay to speak. What? Believe. We have come to believe and we have come to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus had already told him? He said, you're blessed because you don't know that by natural, physical understanding and wisdom. He said, you know that because my Father has revealed that to you. So we see the activity of God. First of all, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. The Father is the one who draws people to Jesus. Now, jump down over to verse 70. He says, and Jesus says, did I not choose you? Did I not what? I choose you. Now, here you have the Trinity involved in the salvation of a person. Listen, the Spirit gives life. The Father draws people to Jesus, obviously through His Spirit, and Jesus does the choosing. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Turn to Romans chapter 8. You have the words, Jesus said, of, of Peter said, of eternal life. He knew the words of Jesus were true. Why? It had been granted to him. He had received by revelation. No one can say Jesus is Lord and affirm the Lordship of Christ, but by the Holy Spirit. Sinners need God's aid to understand spiritual things. In Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 5, let's look at that. Paul writing to the Roman Christians in Rome, in Romans chapter, what did I say, 8? Verse 5, he writes this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now here he makes a distinction between the flesh and the spirit, the lost and the believing community. When he talks about those who live according to the flesh, he's not talking about Christians. He's talking about those who are lost. Those that, the, the area that we came from, from the flesh. Those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. That's the only thing they can think about. Because spiritual things are not in their domain to understand and to know. So the people who are lost, just like you and I were one day, we set our minds only on the things of the flesh. We don't think about God or spiritual things or we don't think about, you know, Interested in the kingdom, any of that. You might be here today, and that's, you know, so well, somebody brought me here. I just think about that. But listen, because it might change your life. Those who have set their minds to the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, all right, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, notice what he says about the carnal mind, the, the man who is without God, without the Spirit of God, because the carnal mind is an enemy against God, is an enmity against God. It is an enemy of God. The natural fallen man is an enemy of God. That's why when God came and showed up in the, on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ, they didn't welcome him with open arms. They crucified him on a cross. Somebody said, well, if I'd been alive at the time of Jesus and he had come, and I wouldn't have crucified him. If you hadn't believed his message, you would. Because the same ones who were, you know, crying, Hosanna, blessed is who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember in that religious festival they were having, they, Jesus coming in and riding on a donkey, they were like, yes, blessed is coming in the name of the Lord. Those were the same people later who were saying, crucify him, crucify him. So don't think of yourself a little better than most sinners because all fallen sinners would do the same thing. And here's why. They're an enemy of God. Notice he says the carnal mind, verse 7, is an enemy of God. It is not subject to the law of God. It doesn't subject itself to what God commands. That's not the whole of it. That's not even the worst of it. Look at the next phrase. This is the worst of it nor indeed can be. Again, can is ability. The person without God doesn't subject himself, to, doesn't care about the laws of God, doesn't care about what God commands. He's living his own life, having his own th you know, pleasures, things. But he doesn't subject himself to what God's law says. And he, Paul says, and he can't even do it. He can't even do it if he wanted to. He is not able to because 
of his fallen condition. And that, folks, is how far men have fallen and what kind of prisoners they are to their own sin and rebellion against God. So when man sinned and disobeyed God, he became a prisoner, unable to penetrate the spiritual things that God wanted him to know. So these are two mutually exclusive dimensions. The lost, those who are in the flesh, and then those who are in the spirit. And the reason I can tell you that, and it's the truth, because in verse 9 he says, or verse 8 he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They can't, they won't subject themselves to the love of God. They can't even subject themselves to the love of God. And so they're not going to please God with anything that they do. Verse 9, but you, talking about Christians, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. So this is the other dimension, the people who are in the Spirit. Now, go to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would be. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the Ephesian church and gives us a litany of maladies that are inescapable to the lost, to those who are without Christ, who are unregenerate. Apart from divine intervention, these dominate the life of fallen People. And in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, listen, listen closely. This I say, therefore, Paul said, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. And of course, he's talking there, the Gentiles are the pagans, those who don't know God. Now, listen, don't walk like the pagans. He's talking to Christians now who walk in what? In the futility of their mind. Verse 18. Their understanding is what? Darkened. They have no life. They're alienated from the life of God. They have physical life. They have existence. But they don't have life from God. They're dead spiritually. Because of the what? They're ignorant. Because of the ignorance, they say, well, well, I know some people that are very smart and are not Christians. Yes, they're worldly wise and smart. But spiritually, they are blind as a bat. Why? Because they're ignorant. They cannot penetrate. They don't submit to God. Their mind and, and flesh cannot even submit themselves to God. Why can't they do that? Why are they ignorant? Because of the blindness. Say it out loud. Blindness of their heart. So here... We have futility of mind, darkened understanding, alienated from the life of God, ignorance, blindness of heart. Verse 19, he says, they've give, giving themselves past feeling. All right? In other words, they have no ability to sense spiritual things. Oh, they can feel natural things, but they're completely uh, uh, anesthetized, if you would, against all spiritual things. They don't feel anything. They have given themselves now to what? To lewdness. This is what is so striking about our day where people today say, hey, I can be whoever I want and whatever I want, you know, and, and I believe that I'm this one, that. And, and so they think they're free. I'm free to live and be as whatever I want. And if I think I'm a girl, then I'm a girl. And people who have spiritual understanding look at that and say, Oh, yeah. And I can live, you know, I can marry whomever I want. I can do, you know, I'm free. And they don't realize that freedom is not freedom. But bondage. Like every other sin. And so he says they've gone past feeling. Given themselves over to lewdness. And what else? To work uncleanness. They're unclean and greedy. So you see, all the litany of maladies, as I said, that Paul lists here, a fallen man. Futility of mind, darkened understanding, alienated from life, ignorant, blind of heart, past feeling, given themselves to lewdness, unclean and greedy. That describes humanity, fallen humanity. Now, man is caught in that condition. So now let me say, so that's the reason why people can't believe so why are you saved? 
So if you're saved today, if you're in Christ, if you know the freedom that Christ has brought into your life, listen to me. God in His sovereignty has given you the will and the faith to believe the gospel and to believe in Christ. God has given you that. You're blessed, Simon. You don't know that because you're sharp. You're that. You know that because my father has revealed it to you. Now, let me show you why I said that. Because it doesn't do any good for me just to say things unless I can show you the scripture. God has given you the will and the faith to believe. You can't even boast of the fact that you believe. Well, I'm a Christian today, I believe, because I came to Christ. I was smart enough not to want to go to hell, and so I came and I gave my life to Christ. Those people, they're ignorant. They're, they're going to go to hell, and they just don't know, you know. No, no, no. Reason makes you, what makes you different from them? Paul said, what makes you different? If everything you have, you've received. You receive from God. You received your life. You received intelligence. Everything you have, God gave it to you. You might not acknowledge him. You might say, no, I'm, I'm just smart because I went to school. But before you, you went there, you had a brain that didn't have very much in it. Right? People started putting stuff in there. Sometimes bad stuff. So you receive this from God. Look, look, at, look at Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. This is what Paul says. For it is God who works in you. So if you're a Christian today, as Paul said, God is working in you. He works in you both to do two things. One, to what? To will. See, remember I told you that the, the carnal mind, the, the will of man, the fleshly man, he says he doesn't submit himself to the law of God and he can't even submit himself to the law of God. So how do you now, as a Christian, you read the Scripture and you say, you know, I want to be obedient to God. I want to obey His commands. I want to do what's right and what will please my Father. I want to do that. How can, how can you do that now? Why can you do that when you can, couldn't even do it before? You were not able or capable of doing it because God came to work in you, and by His aid, He makes you willing. God is at work in you to will. And what else is He in you to work? To do. Not only to have a willingness now, but to take action and to do. And that's why you were able to believe upon Christ and receive the revelation of God because God made you willing and then made you to believe. Because after all, faith, faith God, isn't something we work up, folks. Faith is something that is a gift from God. The Bible says that God gives to every man the measure of faith. When Paul said he's talking to Christians. But now I want you to understand this. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, who is the one who began your faith? Looking unto Jesus, Paul said, the author and finisher of our faith. Who authored your faith? Who? Jesus, the reason, that's why I say it, God, by an act of the sovereign grace, granted you the willingness and the ability to believe and the wanting to believe because he works in you to will and to do. And here he says that Jesus is the one who authors our faith. He's the one who began your faith. You didn't even begin that yourself. Are you getting the picture? God intervened to bring us to saving faith. James chapter 1, verse 17, James wrote this, every good gift and every perfect gift comes from who? From above, from God. That's what he's referring to. Notice, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above. Notice the word gift. By grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. If you're saved today, it was by a gift. And notice that James says this gift and every good gift comes from above. When Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom. You can't enter the kingdom unless you are born again. So as I ask people, and I've said this to you before, people write books in how to be born again. Now, how many of you here, honestly now, be honest with me, how many of you here were born? Some of you don't know. 
You say, I was born. I came into the world. My mama had me. Now, my next question is, what did you do to be born? Nothing. You just, whoop, came out. You didn't even hit the effort, right? It was your mama that pushed you out. Ah! So when it came to being born physically, you had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Absolutely nada. So when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. That word, anothen, born again, the word anothen, Later used in, in chapter 3, when the Bible says that he that comes from above is that same word, anothen. Jesus is saying, be born from above. Unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Man cannot enter the kingdom of God without the aid of God. So Nicodemus said, well, how, how can a man be born again when he's old? Get him, getting his mother's womb again and be born? Jesus said, no. That's how we're talking to you. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he said this, the wind. That word wind is the same word for spirit in the New Testament. Spirit wind. It's the same word. The wind blows where it wants to. And you can't see it, but you can hear the sound of it and you can see the movement, right? You don't know where it's coming from, where it's going. My wife has one of those little things in the yard that, you know, they turn with a wind, like a, like a little windmill. We were putting one out there the other day, and I was, like, putting it in, and it wasn't moving, and it was, like, turning it. I turned it like this, and it started turning, you know, and then all of a sudden, it stopped. And I'm like, what? So I turned it like a little bit this way, and then it started. Then it stopped, then I turned it this way, and the thought came to me, I don't know which way the wind's coming from, right? I mean, we have a general direction, but the wind kind of goes like, Jesus said, so, listen, it's everyone who is born of the Spirit. Just like the wind. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going. Why? Because it is a sovereign act of God. God has mercy people upon the lost. And if He doesn't do that work, no one is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But God, listen, Jesus said, so you must be born again. What do you do? That's the work of God. And if you go right back and read Ezekiel, I guess 36 or so, this is what Nicodemus should have known. Oh, back in Ezekiel 36, I believe it's about the 36th chapter, God prophesied to his people and said, listen, I am going to do something, a work in you. You're, you're, you're all over the, the world, so I'm going to bring you back. And this is what God said, I'm going to wash you with clean water, and I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to take your heart of stone, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, and I will cause you, listen, to walk in my statues, God said. What causes us to walk in His statutes? God has to wash us. God has to take the old heart and give us a new heart. In other words, God has to give us new life in order for us to be able to do what He requires. Now think about, we're talking about intercession. Say, well, we haven't talked about intercession yet. But the reason I'm telling you this is because you need to know this. If you're going to be an intercessor for people who are lost before God with effectiveness. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Put that up again for me. We James 1, 17. It comes from above, he said. From the Father of lights. For there's no variables or shadow of turning. And then he says this in verse 18. Listen. Of his own will. It must say his own will. It wasn't your will. It was his will. Now, he makes you willing. All right? But it was his will that brought us forth. That word actually talks about, another translation says, he gave us birth. The word bringing forth like a child that is born. He gave us birth. By how? By the word of truth. God gave you birth. What Jesus was telling Nicodemus is this is something you do. See? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit, the spirit's involved. It's spirit. And he gave us by an act of his will birth. Why? He imparted life to us because you cannot respond to the gospel as a dead person. God has to first infuse life to you. How does He do it? By His own will. 
And that's why, listen, when you heard the gospel and you believed, it wasn't because you were sharper than other people. It wasn't because you were more educated or maybe smarter and said, you know what, this is a good deal. I think I'll join this. No. The reason that you came, if you're a Christian indeed, if you're a Christian in truth, is you responded because God did something toward you. He revealed to you who Jesus was. He gave you, listen, he imparted by the Spirit breath of life so that you could come alive. And the message that you heard, you were able to believe. Because you ask people, well, how come you believe and some people in your family don't believe? It isn't just because they're stubborn. Yes, they're stubborn. Yes, they're blind. Yes, they're ignorant. Yes, they're in darkness. That's their condition. But it takes more than just understanding and human wisdom. It takes the Spirit of God to impart life to you. When you begin to understand, you know what that does? When you really understand that as a Christian? It doesn't say, well, you know, you ought to believe like me. No. It says, God... You mean to tell me that out of the billions of people that have lived on this earth and all the times and people that have died and gone to hell because they refused the message of the gospel or they just, you know, they were sinners and they were judged for their sin. God, you mean to tell me that you looked on me? Here in the 21st century, this guy that's a sinner, a sinner just like everybody else, was any different. I didn't have anything special about me. Did you notice me? It was of your own free will that you chose to give me birth. And here I am, and now I believe that Jesus is Lord. And I say that Jesus is Lord, and I believe what he taught, and I believe that he conquered death and hell, and I believe that he went away and he said, I'm going to come back one day, and I've got to prepare a place. You mean, I believe all that? The world tells me I believe that because I'm ignorant. The world tells me I believe that because you're just a religious nut. And the Lord said, They're the ones who are ignorant. You are blessed because I have revealed that to you. Our response then, when we understand what God has done in saving us, is to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being merciful to be a sinner. Why do we then need to intercede for lost people before God? Why do we need to pray for those who are lost to be saved? Because they cannot find their way to God without God being merciful to them. They cannot come to God. They cannot submit to God. They're not even able to because they're spiritually dead. Now, quickly, I want you to turn with you to 1 Corinthians. And I want to read a section here. Paul explains here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 why some people believe and why some are lost or are still lost and why you accepted the gospel and God and other people have rejected the gospel and rejected God. Listen, why... Do many not believe today? Why do many not accept the gospel? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning of verse 18. The first reason is the message is unreasonable. The message to the world who doesn't know anything about spiritual things is it's crazy. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. Paul says, the message of the cross is what? It's foolish. That's what we try to talk to people about Jesus. Let me tell you about this. Ah, you're just a fool. You're just a religious nut. You're foolish. I don't want to hear that myth. I don't want to hear that garbage. The message to the world is, is foolish. Paul acknowledged it. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. 
Because you have to understand, when the, when the Christians went out to preach the gospel, listen, in the first century, they were talking about Jesus as God. He came, he became a man so that he could take on the sin of the world, and then he died on a cross. What? Your God died on a cross? What kind of God is that? <laughs> are, you, are, you not, are you insane? It's not meant to believe in a God who came here, became a man, got mistreated, got, you know, by the Romans, put on a cross, and then he died? Yeah. What kind of God is that? See, that's the, th- that's the only thing the world can know. That's the only thing they can think about. They, yeah, they know the facts about the story, but they don't understand. They have no understanding of what God did in Christ. A crucified God is a dumb message to the Greeks. The second thing, look at verse 20, is that knowing God to them is unattainable through human wisdom. And here's, God, here's what God says through the Apostle Paul. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Or is the disputer of this age, has God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Verse 21, for it, since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. You know what that's saying? That God determined that it was going to be this way. In his wisdom, he determined this. Nobody's going to know me by human wisdom. I don't care how intelligent you are, how educated you are, you cannot know me. By human wisdom. God shut the door. Because see, when man disobeyed God, when God, uh, when man fell in the Garden of Eden, God cast the human race, all of the human race and all the descendants of Adam into a condition in which it is impossible by the means of human wisdom and human intellect to know him. You cannot get there from here. And God designed it that way. Notice what he says in verse 19. He said, I'm going to destroy the what? The wisdom of the wise. I don't care how wise you are. God said, I'm going to destroy the wisdom. I'm going to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So it doesn't take wisdom and it doesn't take prudence to find your way to me. God said, I'm going to get rid of it all. And if you're interested in pursuing this further, you go back to Isaiah 29, verse 14. In Isaiah, because Paul is making an allusion to that uh, chapter, at chapter 29, verse 14. And in, 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 Jeremiah, in Isaiah 29, 14, uh, a king by the name of Sennacherib had come against Judah, the people of God, and was, was destroying everywhere he went. He was just conquering everything. And Sennacherib thought, well, I'm going to, and he boasted against God and against, you know, the, 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 the Israelites. And he said, I'm going to do to you what I've done to other nations. I'm going to subject you and you're going to serve me. This was Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians. And, he, and he, his headquarters is in Nineveh, which was the head of the, of the Assyrian empire. And Sennacherib came against Judah and he had kept against him. And the Lord said something through Isaiah to his people. He said, don't be afraid. And he quoted what I just shared with you. I'm going to destroy the wisdom I'm going to destroy the prudent. The victory that I'm going to give you isn't going to come by wise and understanding men and strategies and your leaders and your military people. It's not going to come through that. God said, you're going to know that I am God. I'm telling you. The people were like this. I mean, this is, this is a world empire. This is a king, you know, who's going to come and take over Judah. And, and, and they were shaking, but they said, God, do something. God, Show yourself to be God. And God said, because you've asked me, I want to do it. And so the Bible says that Sennacherib came against Judah. And he encamped against him. He's going to take him over. And what happens is God said, um, I don't know who it was. Michael, you know, one of the archangels said, uh, I'm going to dispatch you down there. I want you to take care of this little problem for me. Would you go down there? The Bible says an angel came, a messenger came. And while the whole army was encamped, 185,000 soldiers died the day before they were going to attack. And so Sennacherib wakes up in the morning, he looks around and, what in the world? Now the Bible doesn't say how they died. Now they could have died from some kind of, I don't know, virus or what, or the angel just came and just took their breath away and they just died. 185,000 soldiers hadn't even taken their weapons yet to fight and they're dead and he sees all the carcasses. I mean, listen, if you were a world leader and 185,000 of your men died, you don't know why, what would you do? Well, Sennacherib was like, I better go home. So Sennacherib, you know, puts his tail between his legs and he goes home. 
What do you think Judah did? <gasps> wow. God did that. He didn't even did us. 185,000 people dead. And the Bible says Sennacherib goes back home and, he, you know, he's kind of despondent. So he goes into the temple of his God, right, his false God. He goes in and he's worshiping. While he's worshiping, his two sons come in with a sword and kill him. And then his two sons fled. That's kind of a little background. Of, of, and, and the reason I'm telling you this is because God, or the Apostle Paul, is right here. God uh, inspired him to write this. He said, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. I'm going to dis under, uh, destroy, bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He says, where are the wise people? Where are the disputers of this age? I'm going to break them to nothing. So why don't people believe? Well, human wisdom cannot attain the knowledge of God. Our message is unreasonable. Number three, God chooses people that are not too impressive. Verse 26, you see your calling, brothers, not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. God has chosen. Everybody say chosen. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen. I mean, it's just getting lower and lower, right? And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. You know, you look around, you think, well, we're not the most elite people. You know, I mean, there's some very sharp people. There's some very wise people in the world. There's people very influential in the world that know a lot about the world, know a lot about things, but they're ignorant about spiritual things if they don't know God. And we look at those people and say, wow, man, look at, oh, wow. Look at that person. Oh, man, look at all he's done in the world. God says, listen, now look at God's people. Well, yeah. People look at it and say, hey, well, the reason you're a Christian in church is because you're ignorant. Just an over much. You just really haven't been out where the action is. Paul said, God has chosen, listen, not many wise, not many noble. God has chosen foolish things. God has chosen weak things. God has chosen the base things. In other words, God has chosen those who are without rank, those who are despised. And then he says, those which are even not, in other words, non-existent, people that aren't even noticed sometimes. God has chosen them. And I'll tell you what God has not chosen. We're talking about categories because he says the wise, the worldly wise. God has not chosen the mighty, the elite, the movers and the shakers, the influentials. I said, can you be in that category, be chosen by God? Absolutely. But God didn't choose these groups because of what they had and what they thought they had. Influence, ability, worldly wisdom. God had chosen the vessels that nobody thought he could do anything with. So that what? What does he say? Verse 29, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. No one could glory in his presence. Listen to verse 30. But of him, that is of God, you are in Christ Jesus. Now stop there for a moment. Why are you in Christ? Oh, well, because, you know, I listen and I'm pretty sharp and I decided that I would give my life to the Lord. I decided that I would, you know, whatever. No, you're in Christ because he put you there. It is because of him that you are in Christ. Boy, that just cuts all the legs from under self-confidence and self-boasting, doesn't it? You mean to tell me it was God? Yes. Another translation, it says this, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. How did he do it? Listen, listen, this is what Christ became. Christ became to you wisdom from God, 
righteousness from God. Because your, your righteousness wasn't good enough. Sanctification from God and redemption. All those things. Redemption, sanctification, righteousness, and wisdom all came from God to you. By grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, God's people, God chose the people who weren't too impressive. Why also many people don't believe and accept the gospel? Well, because its messengers sometimes are uh, less than fashionable. You know, poor, oh, you mean you listen to that guy, poor innocent preacher? You know, the, the poor, you know, preacher. You mean to tell me you go listen to that Danny Rodriguez down there at Grace Point? What, are you nuts? He doesn't know anything. I don't. I only know, however, the things that matter. And not because I'm smarter than anybody else, but because God was gracious enough to me to reveal them to me. So Paul says many people, they don't believe, they reject the gospel because they're preachers of the message are not very fashionable. Look at chapter 2. I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. I didn't come with, with, a, with a, you know, uh, uh, erudite words, or I didn't come to you with, with eloquence. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, verse 2, and Him crucified. And He says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. God, help me, Lord. In my speech, the thing that I used to speak to you, in my preaching, they were not even with persuasive words of human wisdom. I didn't come to you in wisdom to try to persuade you to become a Christian, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. I'll talk to you in a minute about what that means. What does that mean? People say, well, he came with miracles and everything. No, those happened, but that's not what he's talking about. The demonstration of the Spirit. In other words, the demonstration of what God can do, the power of God, the demonstration of what God's power can accomplish through people who aren't even influential or wise according to the world. And he did that, he says in verse 5, so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, because by the wisdom of men you can't get to God, but in the power of what? Of who? Of God. In the power of God. Now hold your place there. Go to chapter 1. Go back one, one, one chapter. What is the wisdom of God and the power of God? He says, he says, not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Look at chapter 1, verse 24. Here he's talking about Christ, and he says this. To those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the what? Christ who? The power of God. Christ who? The wisdom of God. When I came to you, I didn't come with excellence. He's trying to persuade you. I just came with a simple message. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus. Except who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and proclaim Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the power of God to change a human life. God's son, Jesus, is the wisdom of God. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and you are complete in him. We're complete because of Christ. And I just read it to you earlier. He is your righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He's all those things to you. God made him that to you. So when the devil comes and tells you, well, who do you think, you think God's going to gonna treat you with favor? You think God doesn't know that you're a sinner just like everybody else? Oh, yes, he knows. He knows it better than anybody. But God has done something in my life. He's convinced me that he is a savior to those who call upon him. And that's why I call upon him. And that's why I trust him. Paul goes on to say in verse, listen, 
He just finished saying, your faith shouldn't be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's why I didn't come to you with human wisdom, declaring the testimony of God, the gospel. I didn't come with persuasive words. However, verse 6. Everybody look at verse 6. However, underline that in your Bible. Circle it in red if you need to. Circle it. Put something underneath it. Put a little arrow to it. However. Now, what does that mean? What does the word however mean, right? It, it's a, those of you that are English majors, it's what? It's a conjunction, right? So it, it's joining the thoughts that were said before. Human wisdom doesn't get you to God. You can't come to Him. You can't come that way. God has done away with Him. He has not allowed anyone to come to Him because they're influential, because they're smart, because of anything. God has made that foolish. He's put it aside. However, <laughs> we speak wisdom. Well, wait a minute. Did you just say God's going to destroy human wisdom? Yeah, yeah. But now, it's different now. We, it's all about believers. Now, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Now, there the word mature means to be complete, to be perfected. Remember I just told you, in Christ you are what? You are complete. You're perfected in Christ. God sees you as a child's son with everything God bought for you by the person of Christ. I'm complete in Him. I don't need, I don't have any need of anything. I am complete in Christ. I'm not going to get any more righteous than I am right now. I might get more holy. I might, my, my comportment might be, get better. But my standing before God is righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. I'm not going to get any more righteous as I go along. Except in my behavior. Understand that. I am complete in Christ. By the way, that's the righteousness you, get, you need to get into heaven. If you're trusting in your own righteousness, you're never going to make it. The only way to stand before God, acceptable to God, is by the righteousness of another, and his name is Jesus. God made him to be sin for you so that you could receive his righteousness as a gift, by the way. So he says here, however, we speak wisdom. We speak wisdom among those who are mature, those who are perfected. He's talking about Christians there. Not the wisdom of this age, which I just talked about earlier, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. He says, we speak the hidden wisdom. Now, what is that? Well, I just told you. 1 verse 24. Christ, the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God. So that your faith could not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, in Jesus So that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but in Christ, who is the wisdom of God for us. We're preaching now to people who understand, who are mature, who are complete in Christ. Now, we do teach you wisdom. And all I've shared with you from the Scripture today, folks, is the wisdom of God. And who is His name? What's His name? Jesus. Now, Paul says this, we're speaking to Christians now, the hidden wisdom. Now, listen to this, verse 7, which God ordained. The word is predestined. God predestined this. God did this. God chose this. God ordained this, this wisdom that you now can understand the spiritual things of God now that you are able to understand that as a lost person you could and your friends who are lost can't understand that right now. But you understand it because God has done something in you. And now listen. God has ordained, predestined this wisdom that we now can partake, that we now can share, that we now can give to others. God predestined this before the ages. See, this wasn't something God just thought up today and thought, well, you know, maybe this would be a good thing to do. You know, we usually kind of proceed that way, but God doesn't do that. God knows the beginning from the end. He already knows how everything ends. And he said, before the ages began, God ordained that there would be a wisdom that he would give. Listen, he would give to people that he would choose to bless. That's you if you're in Christ. Listen to what he says. God predestined before the ages. I get these little words right at the end. For our glory. He did it for you. So that you could attain glory. He did it for me. He did it for my glory. So that I could know 
the things that he has prepared for us. Hold your place real quick. Run, jump, run to Romans chapter 9. But I'm trying to finish this. Praise God, I will. Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Listen, if you're a Christian today and, and the Holy Spirit is letting you get this in your mind, if you're like me, you're like, oh, hallelujah. This, this is good. God has done this for me. I couldn't get there. I couldn't believe, but he did this for me. You want some more proof? Real quickly, Romans chapter 9, verse 22. Some of you said they're shaking your head or kind of scratching. Uh, how, how did that, that God do that? He prepared that for us. He prepared that for my glory. Yes. And then Romans chapter 9, look at verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? See, there are people who are going to be judged for their sin. The people who reject the gospel, people who reject God, these are the vessels of wrath. God will one day judge everyone, the whole world. And if your sins haven't been forgiven, you're in trouble. And that's what it's called, a vessel of what? Of God's wrath. In other words, God hates sin and He's going to judge sin. Hopefully you're not one of those. But then He says this, that He might make known the riches of His glory. He wanted to make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of what? What? If you're a Christian, that's you. God put up and puts up with all the sin in the world. People say, well, you know, oh man, the world's just becoming worse and worse. Oh man, so much evil everywhere. Why does God put up with this? God will show His wrath one day. God will show His judgment. There is a day of judgment coming. But what if God, Paul says, was willing to put up with them because He's after you? Because he called you to be a vessel of what? Of mercy. Look at that again. Uh, somebody tell me what verse we're in. I lost my place here. 20 what? 23. Thank you. Listen. What if God, he made known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand. Now, who prepared them? So you didn't come to God because you were very sharp. Because you were smart. Because you were raised in a Christian home. Because of this and that. You came to God, if you've come to God at all, because God has intervened in your life and all the things that I've shared with you earlier. But he says here also that God prepared you, prepared you beforehand for glory. God, if you're a Christian today, if you're a Christ, prepared you for glory. You didn't stumble into the kingdom. Oh, oh man, ah, I became a Christian by accident. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Folks, there was a lot of planning that went into this. And that's why understanding this, you say, Pastor, you haven't talked about interceding. Well, I'm going to close with that. I thought we were going to talk about interceding, praying for the lost. Yes. But until you understand this, you don't understand where they are. And that's why I said, and I'll close with this, that intercessory prayer is not so much concerned with the lost as it is with God Himself. Because folks, when you're interceding for lost people who can't see, can't feel, they're dark, in dark darkening their understanding, they are they are prisoners of sin. They have no ability to submit themselves to God. They have no way of knowing spiritual things unless God intervenes in their life. And you look at your Aunt Mary or your Uncle Bob or your wife or your husband and you, lay, you kneel down in your prayer time before God and you say, God... They can't know you. They're lost. It's their fault. They sinned. But my Uncle Bob, he's going to hell unless you have mercy on him. God, please open their eyes. 
open their ears. As a young boy, I heard my mom up cry. She'd get up at 4.30 in the morning, pray by our bedside, and I hear her tears, and that's what she was praying. Oh, God, don't let my children perish. She would spend the time, God, you are a God of great mercy and compassion. They can't come unless you show them. And it broke her heart, as it ought to break our hearts. We're not to be, well, I'm a Christian, you're not. Well, too bad. No. I know why you've not believed. I know why. Because you don't understand. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And until we have a heart for the lost and their condition, we will never tell them. Until you carry that understanding and a load of saying, God, if you are not merciful to them, they will perish. Please, God, open their heart. You might be praying for your mother. You might be praying for your father. But I tell you what, if you're willing to put in the effort and prayer is the hardest task in the kingdom. That's why very few people do it. You have a fellowship of eating and everybody shows up. You call a prayer meeting and a few people show up. It's the hardest work. But because often we don't understand why God called us to pray for those who are lost. You do understand they're on their way to hell, right? Right? God says, you do understand that they deserve judgment because they've sinned against the holy God. They've violated the Creator's mandates. God said, but I send my Son because I wanted to be merciful to those whom I would be merciful. And I don't know if Uncle Bob fits in that category, but I sure am going to talk to God about him and say, God, be merciful to him. And until you get a burden, because you understand, I came to Christ not because I was smart, because of my human wisdom. I came to God because He had mercy on me. Oh God, thank you. But I never should take the attitude that, well, I'm in, and whoever left out, well, that's up to them. No, you know what, God, I'm in, but I'm in because of you. Now I want to pray for these. Mention them by name. And that's why I told you, become a, a, ask God to give you, to show you. It might be your neighbor, friend, relative. It might be somebody that, you know, you hung out or haven't seen for a long time. It might be a stranger that you, go, you come into contact with and God says, I want you to begin to pray for them. And you begin to intercede for them, but you begin to intercede for them that way. That's what Jeremiah did. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. You read the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was very firm and strong when he spoke to the nation. He said, you, you're a you're, you're sinner. You're sinning against God. You, you, you deserve judgment, this and that. And he, man, he was a hard core prophet. But you read this book of Lamentations, Lamentations, right, the weeping, and he was called the weeping prophet. And in those lines that he writes in Lamentations, he cries out to God, oh God, be merciful to Israel. They're your people. God, they're, they're lost. They violated your commands, but oh God, please turn to them. That's the way you and I need to, to be, carry a burden. Some of you sitting here today, you know people that don't know the Lord. And you've invited them to church and they don't want to come. And you think, well, they just don't have any interest. You're right, they don't. But know why? Because they're in darkness. They might be smarter than you are. They might have a better job than you are. But they're on their way to hell and the judgment of God. And as you pray for them, God will open doors to reach them. Because God wants to be merciful to people. Can you say amen? Would you bow your head with me right there where you are? Those of you that are watching us online, would you bow your head? I want to pray for you first of all. You may have heard this message today. You say, I didn't know that unless God intervenes in my life, I'm lost. 
I will perish. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And right there where you are, convictions come into your heart and you recognize only God can do this. It should be enough to make you fall on your knees and say, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You're not under any obligation to save any of us. But you said that you are compassionate and merciful. And you will not clear the guilty. But you're a God of great compassion who forgives iniquity. And right there where you are, you call out to God and say, God, save me. Save me. Thank you for helping me to understand today what I've heard that without you, I am completely and totally in bondage to sin, can never get out, but only by your grace. And so right now, Lord, I thank you for your call going out into the hearts of those whose ears and eyes you open. Thank you for the mercy. Maybe there's somebody here sitting here today. Lord, they're convicted in their hearts and they say, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me. Lord, I've been disobedient. I've walked away from you. And now I'm beginning to understand. Thank you for opening my mind and spiritual understanding. Thank you for calling me. I humble myself and ask forgiveness of my sin. Tell him right there we are. Come, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, as a church, may we become the people that we need to be for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, <clears throat> amen.